Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. I hope you had a very Merry Christmas. We certainly did. And looking forward to the new year and the end of the decade. Let me start with some macro thoughts. In memoriam was my last article. And I was saying against a global backdrop which was hardly conducive what with the crossfire of a trade war, which I believe is now ebbing, well, for a few months, because Trump has an election to win, and Z, an economy to rescue. To wit, Adam Scrabble on Twitter, who called the phase one deal, China needs dollars and a temporary truce with the Trump administration. Trump needs the salesman's victory, a completed transaction. There were some incredible moves uh, in the holiday period. Uh, liquidity's Christmas gift, dollar yen, did a three standard deviation or 2.6% move. This is from IV Technicals via JS Blockland. And incredibly, we're back at 109.50 after that very dramatic move. And I wrote about these moves we see. I said all global markets have become liquidity traps. And in the early hours is when gremlins, wizards and gins stalk the exchanges like the FX market. On June 17th, I said uh, uh, I was speaking about the oil markets trading 24 hours. And in the early hours is when grim gremlins, wizards and gins and the Quran says that the jinn are made of smokeless and scorching fire. They are usually invisible to humans, but humans do appear clearly to jinn as, so they, as they can possess them. Jinns have the power to travel large distances at extreme speeds and are thought to live in remote areas, so now you know and they stalk the exchanges like the FX markets. And I was saying, you often see these very dramatic movements and one touch is the way to go. Party like it's 1999, NASDAQ hits 9,000 for the first time in year and rally, now up 36%. The S&P 500 hit a record and I think the Dow hit one as well. Uh, going back to that article in memoriam, I was quoting a Bloomberg quote, we call it a grand crew, which in wine terms means a very good vintage. Global stocks are on track for the best December since 2010. Gains on track for double the 30-year December average, David Inglis. 11th of November, I said the bots will be waiting for Santa Claus and a Christmas rally, so President Trump is wont to tweet stock market up big today, a new record in joy. Home thoughts, this huge bull elephant was busy drinking water in the Zambezi River. I crawled down to the river bank with a low angle, I got this image, Manor Pools National Park in Zimbabwe, Kevin Dooley for Africa Geographic. I love the photos, I love the colours in this photo of giraffe silhouettes from Oldonio in Kenya, photo via Great Plains Conservation via the Safari Ridge, and that's a beautiful photograph as well. And another one here, Lake Bogoria is a shallow alkaline lake in the North Kenyan Rift. It is home at times to the world's largest population of lesser flamingos and is famous for spectacular geysers and hot springs along its banks. London Review of Books has taken down its paywall and I was having a look around and I came across uh, um, a review of a uh, review of the Wizard of Oz by Salman Rushdie. In 1992, he writes of the Wizard of Oz so striking were these color effects that soon after seeing the film as a child, 
I began to dream of green-skinned witches. Years afterwards, I gave these dreams to the narrator of my novel, Midnight's Children, having completely forgotten the source. No colours except green and black. The walls are green, the sky is black, the stars are green, the widow is green, but her hair is black as black, begins the stream of consciousness dream sequence, in which the nightmare of Indira Gandhi is fused with the equally nightmarish figure of Margaret Hamilton, a coming together of the wicked witches of the East and the West. And then he's writing about how Oz finally became home. There is no longer any such place as home, except, of course, for the home we make, or the homes that are made for us in Oz, which is anywhere and everywhere, except the place from which we began. Rushdie implies that the alternative to a demystified, demystified Oz, a world of wonders manipulated by pulleys and levers, is not humble roots, but another bright, possibly fraudulent fantasy world. And Judy Garland showing early signs of the flamboyant masochism of her maturity makes Dorothy yearn for Kansas, but when she wakes up in Kansas, she speaks longingly of the colour and excitement of Oz. And then uh, it is a, a very interesting review. Have a look. Of course, I wrote about it a couple of times. The Wizard of Oz is a film made in 1939 and widely considered to be one of the greatest films in cinema history. It is a version of L. Frank Baum's 1900 children's book, The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, and featured the then child star Judy Garland as Dorothy Gale. The wizard is one of the characters unseen for most of the novel. He is the ruler of the land of Oz and highly venerated by his subjects. Believing he is the only man capable of solving their problems, Dorothy and her friends travel to the Emerald City, the capital of Oz, to meet him. Oz is very reluctant to meet them, but eventually each is granted an audience one by one. In each of these occasions, the wizard appears in a different form. Once as a giant head, a beautiful fairy, a ball of fire, and as a horrible monster. When at last he grants an audience to all of them at once, he seems to be a disembodied voice. Eventually, it is revealed that Oz is actually none of these things, but rather an ordinary conman from Omaha, Nebraska, who has been using elaborate magic tricks and props to make himself seem great and powerful. <clears throat> and then in another article, Rushdie is writing about the angel Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Garcia Marquez's genius for the unforgettable visual hyperbole for instance, the Americans forcing a Latin dictator to give them the sea in payment of his debts in the autumn of the Patriarch. They took away the Caribbean in April. Ambassador Ewing's nautical engineers carried it off in numbered pieces to plant it far from the hurricanes and the blood-red dawns of Arizona may well have been sharpened by his years of writing for the movies, but the grandmother is more important than any of these. She is Gabriel Garcia Marquez's voice. They had an enormous house full of ghosts. They were very superstitious and impressionable people. In every corner there were skeletons and memories, and after six in the evening you didn't dare leave your room. It was a world of fantastic terrors. The damage to reality was, is, at least as much political as cultural. In Marquez's experience, truth has been controlled to the point at which it has ceased to be possible to find out what it is. 
The only truth is that you are being lied to all the time. Colossally overblown figure of the patriarch who has one of his rivals served up as the main course at a banquet and who, having overslept one day, decides that the afternoon is really the morning so that people have to stand outside his windows at night holding up cardboard cutouts of the sun. El realismo magical, magic realism at least as practiced by Garcia Marquez, is a development of surrealism that expresses a genuinely third world consciousness. It deals with what Naipaul has called half-made societies, in which the impossibly old struggles against the appallingly new, in which public corruptions and private anguishes are more garish and extreme than they ever get in the so-called North, where centuries of wealth and power have formed thick layers over the surface of what's really going on. In the work of Garcia Marquez, as in the world he describes, Impossible things happen constantly and quite plausibly out in the open under the midday sun. It would be a mistake to think of Marquez's literary universe as an invented self-referential closed system. He is not writing about Middle Earth, but about the one we all inhabit. Macondo exists, that is its magic. It sometimes seems, however, that Marquez is consciously trying to foster the myth of Garcia land. Compare the first sentence of 100 Years of Solitude with the first sentence of Chronicle of a Death Foretold. Many years later, as he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aurelino Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice 100 years and on the day they were going to kill him Santiago Nassar got up at 5.30 in the morning to wait for the boat the bishop was coming on. Both books begin by first invoking a violent death in the future and then retreating to consider an earlier extraordinary event. Now look at this mind-bending time-lapse with the Milky Way stabilized shows the Earth is spinning through space. That's from uh, Creditors Brumo via Wonder of Science. This is the Milky Way in the night sky over our tent Serengeti National Park, Bill Clip, Africa Geo. Super long read article in The Guardian, Humans Were Not Centre Stage, How Ancient Cave Art Puts Us in Our Place. Today, almost a century later, we know that Lasso is part of a global phenomenon originally referred to as decorated caves. They have been found on every continent except Antarctica, at least 350 of them in Europe alone thanks to the cave-rich Pyrenees, with the most recent discoveries in Borneo, Croatia. Uncannily, given the distances that separate them, all are adorned with similar decorations, handprints or stencils of human hands, abstract designs containing dots and cross-hatched lines, and large animals, both carnivores and herbivores, most of them now extinct. This struck me with unexpected force, no doubt because of my own particular historical situation. Almost 20,000 years after the creation of the cave art in question, in about 2002 we had entered the age of selfies in which everyone seemed fascinated by their electronic self-portraits. I found myself exhilarated by our comparatively ego-free ancestors who went to great lengths and depths to create some of the world's most breathtaking art and didn't even bother to sign their names. 
Amade Ozanfant wrote of the art in the Le Aziz caves. Ah, those hands, those silhouettes of hands spread out and stenciled on an ochre ground. Go and see them. I promise you the most intense emotion you have ever experienced. In the Paleolithic world, humans were not at the centre of the stage. A paper published, oddly enough, by the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention expresses puzzlement over the omission of naturalistic depictions of humans, attributing it to Paleolithic people's inexplicable fascination with wildlife. The marginality of human figures in cave painting suggests that, at least from a human point of view, the central drama of the Paleolithic went on between the various megafauna, carnivores and large herbivores. When a young man kills much meat, he comes to think of himself as a chief or a big man, and he thinks of the rest of us as his servants or inferiors, one Kalahari hunter told the anthropologist Richard B. Lee in 1968, we can't accept this. We refuse one who boasts, for someday his pride will make him kill somebody. So we always speak of his meat as worthless. This way we cool his heart and make him gentle. So really, it's a tremendous article and careful analysis of the handprints found in so many caves reveals that the participants included women and men, adults and children. If cave art had a function other than preserving information and enhancing ecstatic rituals, it was to teach the value of cooperation, which to the point of self-sacrifice was essential for both communal hunting and collective defence. Well worth a read. It's very fascinating. This is the Lasso Caves in southwestern France. This is Cueva de los Manos in Argentina, the cave of Altamira in Spain, again the Lasso Caves in France, and finally lions, rhino, and buffaloes drawn in charcoal more than 30,000 years ago in the Chauvet Cave in southeast France. Tokyo's mid-century modern icon, the Akura Hotel, is back after a billion-dollar makeover. It's a thousand dollars a night, but my, it looks lovely. Look at this. Akura's iconic lobby has been fully recreated. It was one of those rare experiences that transported you to another time, from the quality of lighting to that slightly musty, humid, cigarette-infused scent that was always hanging in the lobby. No matter how busy the lobby was, there was this hushed quality. The lattice for the shoji paper windows assembled without nails, the silk wall tapestry with four petal flowers, and the chairs and tables arranged like plum blossoms are utterly familiar, yet new or restored. This is the cabinet's Heian Noma Banquet Hall. At the lowest levels of the Heritage Wing are 19 banquet and meeting rooms, seating capacity of 2,000. Now, a couple of other photographs. There are a few things as spectacular as the African night sky. That's Aldonio again. Took me back to Rumi. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. We are nothing but stardust lost in a mysterious vastness. Dust is little, but each grain illuminates in one way or another the infinite course of time. And then we have this eclipse. This is millones de personas tuvieron este jueves la oportunidad de observar el último eclipse de sol de la década. Um, this is a partial solar eclipse seen from Kuwait City via Yasa al Zayat, and a rare ring of fire solar eclipse is seen from Wan Twin in central Myanmar. Moving on to uh, political reflections, Geopolitics 2019, the year of street protest, Gideon Rachman writes in the Financial Times, certain years in history. 1848, 1917, 1968, 1989. 
conjure up images of street protests, mass demonstrations and revolutionary turmoil. What he, when historians put 2019 in perspective, they may also declare it a vintage year for popular unrest. In terms of sheer geographical spread, it is hard to think of a year to rival this one. Protests large enough to disrupt daily life and cause panic in government have broken out in Hong Kong, India, Chile, Bolivia, Ecuador, Colombia, Spain, France, the Czech Republic, Russia, Malta, Algeria, Iraq, Iran, Lebanon and Sudan. And that list is not comprehensive. Other political leaders felled by mass demonstrations include Bouteflika of Algeria and Bashir of Sudan, both of whom fell in April after decades in, pa in power. The slogan made famous at the time of the Arab Spring, the people want the fall of the regime, is once again being chanted. In today's connected world, ideas and slogans can even jump continents effortlessly spread by the smartphone. In an effort to prevent protests going viral through social media, India has shut down mobile communications in some of the cities affected by mass unrest. So while 2019 already qualifies for a place in the annals of street protest, it is possible that the really world-shaking year may turn out to be 2020. I wrote about this in an article called The New Economy of Anger in October. The revolutionary contingent attains its ideal form not in the place of production, but in the street where for a moment it stops being a cog in the technical machine and itself becomes a motor, a machine of attack, in other words, a producer of speed. I said the phenomenon is spreading like wildfire in large part because of the tinder dry conditions underfoot, prolonged standoffs, eviscerate economies, reducing opportunities and accelerate the negative feedback loop. I quoted Gramsci, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Now is the time of monsters. And I said, this is a revolution and it is a global phenomenon. It is not over. More and more people are gathering in the streets. Badra punchline, simply put, Hindutva as an ideology is not contemporaneous with the 21st century. It isolates India and world opinion. This is the lesson of the present day churning, he says. 2nd of December, I wrote about the politics of ethnocratic nationalism, saying they are a bust, in my view. This is an RSS march from Telangana. They are mobilizing, says Suchi Trav. France 24, the best of times, the worst of times for India's Narendra Modi. The year began with an electoral landslide for Modi, but it is ending in an unprecedented display of opposition against his divisive policies. Police crackdowns and an organized Hindu right-wing mobilization could make 2020 a very violent year for the world's largest democracy. 2019 began with the stars aligning to make it another year of Modi, it's ending in cosmic disarray for the man at the center of personality cult that could not be questioned for more than half a decade without the fear of threats, legal harassment, arrest, trolling, or at worst, a violent justice by vigilantes. In Mumbai, banners decrying the links between Nazism and the Rashtriya Swana Sevak Sang, the RSS, um, in which Modi once served as a full-time worker, were explicit. When Hindus and Muslims agree, what can Nazis do? Modi's about turn in just 12 months from pole-sweeping leader, worshipped by his supporters, to publicly proclaimed hate monger. Destroying the foundations of the Indian Republic was one of the most dramatic developments of 2019. 
He had such a phenomenal victory in the 2019 election, but for reasons that rationally make no sense, Modi decided not to have an economic agenda, but to push a social one to remake India. The year is culminating into a very bad ending for Modi. His international reputation is in tatters, with major US and British papers, as well as leading French dailies such as Le Monde, pulling away the Modi mask. For the first time, the Western press is talking of Modi, not as an economic reformer, but as an authoritarian Hindu nationalist leader. It's a very big transformation. Talking about Amit Shah, saying he's the real brain behind the operation, propelling a series of events culminating in the Citizenship Amendment Act. At a campaign rally ahead of the 2019 polls, Shah turned his invective against a pet Hindutva target, illegal Muslim immigrants from neighbouring Bangladesh, calling them termites and vowing to pick up infiltrators one by one and throw them into the Bay of Bengal. Howdy Modi rally with President Trump. Um, mounting disquiet over the Modi administration's bid to build a countrywide surveillance network. I do think there's a risk of increasing violence because they're not going to go quietly, said Kandar. They will do everything in their power to get back the narrative. I don't think it's going to be pretty. I wrote in, about this on the 2nd of December. Modi, whose calling card was economic growth in Gujarat, notwithstanding his fondness for a good old-fashioned pogrom, and I was saying he's clearly embarked on a West Bank level settlement project of Kashmir. GDP grew by just 4.5% in July to September, lowest level since early 2013. Growth has fallen now for six consecutive quarters. He, of course, swept to power five years ago, promising to take India's economy to new heights and create millions of jobs every year. This is a photograph of democracy in India by Rana Ayub. Those who search for dawn don't fear the night. This is uh, in consortium news. There is little that divides Modi's fascistic RSS and his Vishwa Hindu Parishad from the piety movements of Tablighi Jamaat with its millions of Muslim followers and these neo-Pentecostal formations in Latin America says Vijay Prashad. Janine Anez, the president of Bolivia, walked into the burned palace, Palacio Quemado, with an enormous Bible in her hand. The Bible has returned to the palace, she said, as she seized power. Camacho followed Anez into the palace. He was holding a crucifix. Pachamama will never return to the palace, he said. Bolivia belongs to Christ. Bolsonaro, like Camacho and the others, is rooted in these transnational evangelical neo-Pentecostal networks. Modi emerges from his own authoritarian religio-political movement, invited Bolsonaro to be the chief guest at India's Republic Day parade on 26 January 2020. So he's saying there's little that divides all these groups. Near Brazil's favelas, the storefronts are now occupied by a line of neo-Pentecostal churches, by liquor shops and by a few restaurants. The argument that the elite is trying to colonize the families of the poor by eroding the authority of the father. Both Anes and Camacho made racist statements about the indigenous communities of Bolivia, whose faith they consider satanic. The RSS view of Muslims and the Adivasis, the indigenous, and the Tablikis view of apostates, Murtads, mirror this attitude. And then saying, uh, evidence for Sagata's view came to us a decade ago when Dr. Kapya Kaoma and the political research associates showed how U.S. conservative evangelicals assisted by the U.S. government pushed an agenda of homophobia in Africa, Kenya, Nigeria, and Uganda, Little wonder that these currents, including the current led by Anas and Camacho, are cosy with the military and with imperialism. Even if the push comes from U.S. evangelicals, or in the case of American-made Islam from the CIA, it finds its own allies amongst ruling elites and others who drive an agenda 
rooted in older religious forms but weaponized for their aims. Neo-Pentecostal churches and neo-Hindu gurus operate amongst people who are often the poorest of the poor, and yet it is amongst these social groups that they promote a prosperity gospel. Ruling elites sit and write their support with checks and the bright lights we see the working class stumble in and seek a soul in soulless conditions, but the lights are so bright that they often cannot see into the corners. This is Inez with her Evangelical Bible. A nude portrait of Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata riding a horse wearing high heels is causing an uproar in the country. Two more demographic milestones for Japan in 2019. The number of births falls below 900,000 for the first time since records began in 1899. Deaths outnumber births. Population falls by more than 500,000 for the first time. I listened to her before, but she's well worth listening to. Shoshana Zuboff on surveillance capitalism. And then my friend Delush 111. I put some Bee Gees music over North Korean marching. It sounds fantastic. Let's turn now to the international markets. Uh, Euro dollar 111.25. That's moved up. 97.42 dollar index, Japanese yen 109.51, Swiss franc 0.9802, the pound, that's regained 130, 130.20, the Australian dollar 0.6947, India rupee 71.20, South Korean 111.60.47, the real 407.315, Egyptian pound 16.0381, and the RAND at a four-month high, 14.1245. Dollar index, as I said, 97.43. Euro dollar, this is from FX Pet Titan, uh, last at uh, 111.25. Sterling, um, as I said, 130.20, uh, moving higher. Crude, this is the 2023 uh, contract, looks ready to bust a move. That's from Pinecone Macro. I didn't expect it to push on so high. I remember talking about the rebound. We got a very dramatic rebound, but we've really continued on. WTI crude oil, this is from the market here. Last trading at $61.81 and looking firm and wanting to push higher. Gold, Tommy Thornton, last at $15.07.75. That's also pushed dramatically higher of late. Big, bold, up move. Emerging market currencies in 2019. This is from Daniel Lacal. Have a look at that. Sub-Saharan Africa. Turkey will send troops to Libya at the request of Tripoli as soon as next month, President Recep Tayyip Erdogan said on Thursday. He's complaining about the support for Haftar. They're all helping a war putschist and baron Haftar whereas we are accepting an invitation from the legitimate government of the country, that is our difference. So he's very much on the front foot um, and looking to expand his influence and intervene in Libya. We find that the countries of Africa are collectively net creditors to the rest of the world to the tune of $41.3 billion in 2015. That's the Global Justice Organization in the United Kingdom. African countries received $161.6 billion in 2015, mainly in loans, remittances and aid in the form of grants, yet $203 billion was taken from Africa, either directly, mainly through co corporations repatriating profits and by illegally moving money out of the continent, or by costs imposed by the rest of the world through climate change. An estimated $29 billion a year has been taken from Africa in illegal logging, fishing, and the trade in wildlife and plants. Gabriel Zuckman, an academic at the London School of Economics, estimated in 2014 that rich Africans were holding a massive $500 billion offshore, amounting to 30% of all Africa's financial wealth. Ethiopia tops the list of the world's fastest growing nations in the past decade. That's David Pilling. As I said, uh, severally, the most consequential arrival of an African politician of the African stage 
since Mandela walked out of prison, blinking in the sunlight and constructed his rainbow nation. That's Prime Minister Abbey. 9th of December, I said they're still popping quaaludes in Lusaka, and the Zambian government has confirmed that the AFDB has imposed sanctions on the country for failure to service loans. The amount is about $1.5 million, which tells us how stressed out the situation is. The United States recalled its ambassador to Zambia on Monday. Um, we don't want such people in our midst. We want him gone, President Lungu told the state-owned television channels ZNBC. He later told Sky, if that is how you're going to bring your aid, then I'm afraid the West can leave us alone in our poverty and we'll continue scrounging and struggling. Um, the State Department said that his remarks were the equivalent of a declaration that the ambassador's persona non grata. Um, both American taxpayers and Zambian citizens deserve a privileged two-way partnership not a one-way donation that works out at $200 million per meeting with the head of state, Mr. Foote had written. A recent report by the Environmental Investigation Agency that investigates environmental crime and abuse described the president, his daughter, and two ministers as central figures in a cartel that traffics Mukula rosewood trees. His voice is powerful. He had exposed their hypocrisy and corruption, said the popular musician Fumba Chama, who has repeatedly criticized government corruption in songs like Koswe Mumpoto, which means rat in the pot. Mr. Chama, whose stage name Pilato stands for people in lyrical arena taking over, has been targeted by the government multiple times. In its statement, the State Department said the United States firmly opposes abuses against LGBTI persons. Governments have an obligation to ensure that all people can freely enjoy the universal human rights and fundamental freedoms to which they're entitled. $500 million of health aid is given by the U.S. every year to Zambia. As I said, the canary in the coal mine is Zambia. For fun, here are the shoes of the decade worn by Mugabe's sons. That's by All About Africa. South African all shares up 8.55% year to date. The Rand has hit a four month high of 14.1142. The Egyptian pound is at 16.0369. EGX30 is up 6.51% so far this year. Nigerian all shares down 16.99% so far this year. Ghana Stock Exchange is down 8.45% this year. Look at this short video from Canary Mugume. Didn't go well for presidential advisor on Kampala affairs. She steps on stage and before she even starts to sing, the audience starts pelting bottles at her, forcefully stops her performance. And that's the signal in the noise. Uh, 23rd of December, I said, what this tells me is that an important source of buy-side demand for government of Kenya shilling paper is now limit long. There was a 17% performance rate. Mohamed Welier says, if this persists in January, we face a debt default. Cash crisis in the horizon, as everyone is focused on BBI, a show about nothing. Sunil Sanger takes the other side, says not unusual for the last auction of the year to be heavily undersubscribed. Most banks and fund managers square their books earlier and give the last couple of year-end auctions a miss. Dixon Magetcha, the deposits drawn from parastatals by Treasury drained banks of significant deposits. They are using maturing Treasury papers to cover the liability deficit created in the balance sheet. He says it should normalize as government spending picks up, or the MPC may have to consider a CRR cut. Banks are struggling to auction properties at a minimum bid price. Uh, NCBA MD wants law requiring banks to auction properties at no less than 75% of market value amended, or for the state to create an asset management company that will shoulder the difference between buyer price and valuation. Uh, the problem is that nobody is offering 75%, so we keep advertising, but we're not selling. 
Today, those who have money are sitting on it, and those with assets are sitting with them. We are looking at each other. Only lawyers and auction auctioneers are making the money. John Gatora. And therein lies the problem. The auctions are meant to establish the market value, but if that is already dictated, then we have a hung position. No sale, no co commerce, zero velocity of money. Bad economy, he says. The nation has a deep dive article why outgoing CEO Sebastian Mikoj found Kenya Airways' top seat too hot to handle. He spotted the theft of tyres and he said this is a microcosm of the entrenched series of problems afflicting the once pride of Africa. These are just tyres, but we have the same problem with fuel with parts. The loss-making airline, this does not look correct, spends $50 million a day. It looks too high. The biggest enemy when you're restructuring are not outside forces. I'm actually not afraid of Emirates. I'm afraid of this internal setbacks, he says. We reduce the number of suppliers, but according to me, you can still reduce them by one third. But it takes a lot of time. For example, for spare parts, we needed to have a direct contract with Boeing. How they didn't have one is a mystery. However, talks with Boeing took too long. Then he's describing negotiating with the unions. The number of bottles of whiskey I took with them while negotiating made me almost an alcoholic. Kenyan taxpayers gave us $750 million of sovereign guarantees and I pay these guys more than British Airways pilots and nobody says anything. And I'm the bad guy, he says hastily adding. The next CEO who will come will have the same situation. Revenue was hit by constantly cancelling or delaying flights and whatever is buried in the fuel or currency hedge books. Nairobi all shares up 17.97% year-to-date and the NSC 20 is down 7.82% year-to-date. Wishing you a great weekend.